Thank, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon. Um, I've got, I think, essentially 45 minutes to tell you about the Cairo Geniza, um, which is really not enough time. I mean, if I were here to talk about Dead Sea Scrolls, I think I could do it in 45 minutes uh, with time for questions. Um, and similarly, the other great collections. Yeah, but the, the thing about the Cairo Geniza, it's all encompassing. It's a very large collection, which essentially is everything that was written down by the Jewish community of Fustat, old Cairo, in Egypt, over a period of, well, we say a thousand years, but in actual fact, some of, um, some of the manuscripts are really much earlier than, uh, than the 11th century. And um, there was a period of time between about the 13th century and the 16th century when the Jewish community of Fustat dwindled almost to nothing. And consequently, they didn't really put many manuscripts in the collection. And that only re-emerged as an archive in the, uh, with the arrival of the Ottomans in Egypt in the, in the 16th century. Now, this, I'm, I timed this lecture. I was supposed to give this lecture slightly earlier in the year, but I was a bit late at getting paperwork done. Um, because we have a big exhibition on in Cambridge at the moment called Discarded History. Um, uh, the, the title's been slightly controversial because some of my colleagues say, but it wasn't discarded, it was carefully put into a room. Um, but we quite like the title Discarded History, and that's on in Cambridge University Library, but only until the 28th of October, it started in April. Um, and it is a small glimpse, it's about 100 items on display, of the historical core of the Cairo Geniza, that is the documentary sources that make up the... Um, uh, the, the writings left behind by the Jewish community of Fustat that tell us about themselves. Um, so if you have the opportunity to come to Cambridge, I would strongly recommend it. Uh, we are hoping to tour the exhibition. It's been so hugely successful in Cambridge. We've had 30,000 visitors, which for Cambridge University Library is tremendous. Um, we're hoping to tour it, uh, so you might get an opportunity to see it if you're in New York, but I, could not, I cannot yet tell you when. Um, the collection looked like this, um, not in its original form, because it sat in a, in a cupboard for which we have no good photos, unfortunately. But this is Solomon Schefter, whose name has become synonymous with the Cairo Geniza. He wasn't the first person to see the Geniza. Um, he wasn't the last person to see the Geniza. But he was the person who got there with the most money and took it mostly back to Cambridge. Um, now, one of the things about the Geniza, and one, one of the reasons why talking about it is actually quite difficult, is it's got such a great discovery story, the origin story of the Cairo Geniza. It's much better than Dead Sea Scrolls, which is highly dubious anyway, wandering off chasing a sheep. Um, it's, it's got a much better story, but to do that story justice takes at least 45 minutes, so I'm going to have to gloss over some of it, but I would recommend, if you're interested, um, two books in particular. One is called Sacred Trash, terrible title. Um, but it's an extremely good book, um, written by an American poet um, who also happens to be a Geniza researcher and his wife, who's a, a biographer. And uh, that covers in a lyrical fashion, and in, in fact did lots of research in the primary sources, the history of the um, acquisition discovery, the modern rediscovery of the Cairo Geniza, and uh, what it has told us about medieval Judaism. Um, and then the other book is by my colleague in Cambridge, Janet Soskis, which is called Sisters of Sinai. And that is about the two Scottish women who are essential to the story because they put in front of Schechter the manuscript which led him to go off to Egypt and seek to, uh, to discover where uh, the Cairo Geniza was. Um, and that was, a, that was a very well received book because they had, they, these two sisters, two Presbyterian sisters um, from Irvine in Scotland, um, had a, a long and varied career of acquiring magnificent manuscripts from obscure places around the globe. And the Geniza was just one of their great discoveries. So it's worth reading to see um, just what their, uh, their contribution to the history of biblical scholarship has been um, since they were active in the late 19th century. Um, so this is the old university library in Cambridge, which is now the old schools, the administrative hub of the university, uh, in 1898. Um, it's, uh, you know, at a time when there weren't that many books in the university library, so they could afford to give a whole room to Solomon Schechter in his Cairo collection. Uh, he actually left Cambridge shortly after, and um, he had a higher calling to go and help save conservative Judaism in America. Uh, so he very generously gave the collection to Cambridge, and Cambridge, in its, in its usual fashion, hid it away in boxes for about 70 years, um, until it was embarrassed in the 1960s. Um, to do something about it. I may not have time to talk about that um, in much detail, but it's a story of its own. Um, just to sort of uh, situate it within the, the field of uh, discoveries like this amongst Eastern manuscripts, um, it's, you know, it's, it's not of the age of the Dead Sea Scrolls. It's a thousand years younger on the whole. Um, its size is uh, massively dwarfs Nalkamadi. 
Um, it's a bit like the Oxyrhynchus collection, in that it is a little bit of everything, um, except it doesn't come from a rubbish heap. It comes you know, from a cupboard, or it's actually a very large storeroom, it seems, um, whose purpose was to preserve the writings of the Jewish community. Um, in brief, it's called the Taylor Schechter Karaganese Collection, more as to why it's called Taylor in a minute. It's 193,000 manuscripts in Cambridge. When you think manuscript, you might think codex. No, this is, these are fragments. But the fragments can be the size of a carpet, if they're from a Torah scroll, or the size of a stamp, of which about 50,000 are, unfortunately. Um, so it, it, it encompasses all different kinds. And, and it can be a whole choir from a codex and things like that. So it's 193,000 things. Um, the earliest documents we have, we, we haven't carbon dated any, but we believe the earliest documents are the underscript of palimpsest from the 5th century, reused by Jews, Christian, Christian writings originally. Um, but the majority of the collection comes from the classical Geniza period, which is this period when there was a vibrant, strong, uh, economically extremely uh, viable Jewish community in Fastat, the original Islamic capital of Cairo, in the late 10th, uh, 11th and 12th centuries up to the middle of the 13th century. So the periods of Fatimid and Ayyubid rule in Egypt was when the Jewish community of, of Fustat really flourished. And it may have flourished in an earlier period than that, but with the arrival of paper to the Jewish community, which appears to be in the 10th century, writing really took off in a big way. And so that's why they've deposited so much in the Geniza. This is Mrs. Gibson. Um, there were two sisters, Mrs. Lewis and Mrs. Gibson, these twin Scottish sisters. They lived in Cambridge. Um, I have to gloss over many of the interesting details of their life. They, uh, their, their father wanted boys, got twin girls. Um, their mother died in childbirth. He raised them as if they were boys. Um, he, made the, he did an important thing early on in their lives, which is that he encouraged them to travel. And he said that he would take them to any country in the world if they learned the language. And that love of travel and love of languages stayed with them throughout their lives. So later on in life, when they, when they were widowed, they both married relatively late. For Victorian women, they married relatively late in their lives to um, husbands who had the sort of typical Victorian constitution in that they died quite soon after, <laughs> after marriage. Um, one of them, and Janet Soskis tells the story beautifully. I mean, it's a tragic, tragic story, obviously. But one of them, while, after running for a train, um, and the other one whose final words on his deathbed, deathbed were flannel, flannel underwear. Um, so, in amongst this tragedy, however, they had an, a, a particularly um, fortunate uh, happening, which was that they had a, their father had a cousin who founded railways in America and died um, uh, childless. And they inherited, their father inherited, and subsequently they inherited a huge amount of money, something equivalent to 100 million pounds in today's money. So they were immensely rich. And they, they spent that money on a few things. One, they were social gadabouts. So it's, just, it's quite odd when you think of, sort of the Presbyterians from Irving. But they, they loved Paris fashions and throwing parties. And they did a lot of that. And that's what they lived in Cambridge. And they, they built a baronial mansion in the middle of Cambridge. If you stand on Castle Hill in Cambridge, the only hill in Cambridge, you look down. There's a Scottish baronial mansion, which looks a bit out of place. And that's their house that they built. Um, and they loved to travel and get access to uh, libraries of monasteries where they could often speak to the librarians. So they went to St. Catherine's Monastery in the Sinai and they were able to converse fluently, unlike the professor of Greek who didn't actually speak Greek, um, they were able to speak Greek um, with the librarian of uh, St. Catherine's Monastery who was, who was still smarting after Tischendorf had come and stolen Codex Sinaiaticus from under his nose. Um, he uh, was charmed by these two women who could speak to him. And uh, he uh, opened up the cupboard of secret books, uh, sort of things, you know, treasures that kept hidden away. And they made an important discovery, what was in that day the earliest um, discovery of an Aramaic text of the Gospels. And uh, this is a newspaper account of that, and it's filled with the kind of um, details that you love to hear, which is that it was in such a dreadful condition, they steamed it with their tea kettle um, to open up the, the pages. Now, that's an aside, but that's to show, you know, the ladies had form. They were able to discover manuscripts. Um, oh, that's odd. Sorry. Um, right, I got carried away with special effects. Um, so, what importantly, on one of these trips to the Sinai, they um, went to, uh, they, they, they spent a lot of time in the market, and they, uh, they spent a lot of time 
buying things from book dealers. And they felt this was one, an opportunity they had because they could travel to these far out places and get access to these things. And two, they had the money to do it. But secondly, they felt it was their duty as good Christians and rich ones that they should recover these things for biblical scholarship. And on one of their trips to Egypt, they bought about 1,700 manuscripts from book dealers. And returning to Cambridge, they opened up their bundles, because they'd been on quite a long trip through uh, Palestine and so on. They bought manuscripts in different places. And they opened up their bundle, and they were sorting through them on their dining room table in Cambridge. And they found they had bought Hebrew manuscripts, bits of Bible, and they could read Hebrew. Uh, things like that. But there were some things that they couldn't identify, because they were in Hebrew, but they didn't um, accord with any text that the women knew. And the women mainly knew the Bible. That's, you know, their interest in Hebrew is essentially to read the Old Testament. Um, so they happened to call in, uh, to meet their friend Solomon Schechter, who was then teaching rabbinics in the University of Cambridge. And a bit like them, they lived in Cambridge, but they weren't members of the university because they were all those things you couldn't be in Cambridge, women, Scottish, Presbyterian. Um, and Schechter, although he was a member of the university, was also a bit of an outsider because he was one of the few Jews to be a member of the university. Uh, you know, a relatively short period of time after Jews had only first been admitted to the university and enabled to take degrees. Um, and so, for instance, his salary was still paid by a London, uh, by the Montefiore family in London and not by the university proper. And so, consequently, they had gravitated towards each other, along with some other oddballs like James Fraser, the author of The Golden Bow, and so on. And uh, it was quite natural that they would invite him in to look at their manuscripts. Uh, that's Solomon Schechter, looking uh, suitably... They are, he's often described as an Old Testament prophet, um, because he was wreathed in smoke, because he constantly smoked. Um, and they showed him this particular manuscript. Uh, if you look at it, it's, it, it's a very unphotogenic manuscript. I and mean, if you come to Cambridge, we put it on display. It doesn't look much better in the flesh. It's very dark. It's been water damaged, probably. You can see evidence of iron gall ink corrosion um, quite clearly on the left-hand side. Uh, a lot of the ink has been uh, faded, washed away, or lost. Um, but it looks, I mean, if you're familiar with Hebrew, with biblical Hebrew, it looks like a page of the Bible. It's two columns. It's a, biblic a, a biblicizing Hebrew, a biblical language. And it appears to have what looks a bit like Masorah, that is the scribal notes in the margin. It looks a bit like a critical edition. Um, it's on paper, so it's probably not earlier than the 10th century. It's a, a sort of unassuming manuscript, but Schechter got quite excited enough about it that he took it away with him. And subsequently he wrote this note on University Library note paper to Mrs. Lewis, one of the two sisters, Mrs. Lewis and Mrs. Gibson, 13th of May 1896. I think we have reason to congratulate, did he originally write ourselves? Yeah, maybe ourselves. For the fragment I took with me represents a piece of the original Hebrew of Ecclesiasticus. It is the first time it is the first time that such a thing was discovered. Um, sorry about these special effects. Please do not speak yet about the matter till tomorrow. I will come to you tomorrow about 11 p.m. and talk over the matter with you, how to make the matter known. In haste and great excitement, yours sincerely, S. Schechter. And, you know, plenty of ink splashes and so on to indicate that he wrote it in, you know, in a flurry of activity and excitement um, that he had on the dining room table of two Scottish Presbyterian women discovered the lost Hebrew of the biblical or extra biblical book of Ecclesiasticus. So this is not the book of Ecclesiastes, this is not Kohelet from the Old Testament, from the Hebrew Bible, this is Ecclesiasticus from the Apocrypha of the Hebrew Bible um, that made its way into the, uh, into the Bible used by the Orthodox Church, subsequently into the Greek and uh, uh, in uh, Latin Bibles, and was um, still in Schechter's day in the Catholic Bible, but was lost in Hebrew. The last person that he knew had read a Hebrew version of the book of Ben Sira, as it's called in Hebrew, was in about the 1030s, Haiga on, in Iraq. And subsequently, the book had been lost. Now, he was actually involved in a controversy with a man in Oxford over whether the book was ever really transmitted in Hebrew at all. Um, uh, Margoliev claimed that uh, the book was a product really of the Greek-speaking rabbinic world, um, and consequently, he had been in Jewish circles uh, transmitted entirely in Greek. Um, and Schechter, therefore, was extremely excited um, to discover, one, the original Hebrew, which had been lost, but two, that this was a medieval copy, thus proving that from its perhaps 2nd century BCE authorship, um, it was still being transmitted in the Hebrew language um, down into the Middle Ages. It is difficult to read. Um, it, it, this is, uh, subsequently, they discovered about five more manuscripts of this, but it is dif difficult to read, and you have to be quite impressed that Schechter managed to recognise it. But it's one of the great serendipities of the Karaganesa story that it was shown to the only man in England, 
at that time who would have recognized it because Schechter, a few years previously in 1860, had published an article in the Jewish Quarterly Review, which was then the leading English language journal of Jewish studies, in which he had made a, per a personal study of all of the early rabbinic writings, attempting to find quotations of the book of Ben Sira in Hebrew in them, so that he could try and reconstruct the book that the rabbis had access to. So he had actually read a lot of Ben Sira. He didn't have the whole Hebrew text, but he had taken a phrase here and a phrase there from where it's quoted, for instance, in the Midrashim or in the Talmud Yerushalmi, and other Jewish works of, of the rabbinic and Amoraic periods, and he was attempting to show, to reconstruct the book and show that the rabbis had access to a Hebrew copy. They weren't all translating from the Greek, for instance, and producing their own translations into Hebrew. And it just so happened that within the manuscripts discovered in the, uh, in the Korogeniza, he could find almost exactly the same bits. Um, you can see that uh, between the, the transmission of a thousand years that, that uh, some things have changed, um, but it was close enough that he could recognize the book. Had the book been shown to Margoliouf in Oxford, he would have dismissed it as a forgery if he'd even recognized it, because after Schechter published this, he dismissed it as a forgery. Um, and it was only, actually long after Schechter died, Schechter died in 1915, it was only with the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls in 1947 that the same book turns up in the wider collections around Dead Sea Scrolls. In a, you know, indisputably uh, first century BCE manuscript version, thus um, uh, with a text very close to the medieval copies, thus proving Schechter right, um, but unfortunately too late. Um, now, Schechter got so excited by this discovery by two Scottish women who had bought it in Cairo that he um, wanted to go and find the source of it, and he had a pretty good idea what the source was, because for some years, Cambridge and Oxford had been buying manuscripts from a man called Solomon Wertheimer, who was a rabbi in Jerusalem who made a living, who, who, who supplemented his living as a rabbi by selling manuscripts. And he was um, able to sell a lot of Yemeni manuscripts because a lot of Yemeni Jews were then moving with messianic fervor to, to um, Palestine. Um, and also he had a contact that was acquiring manuscripts for him in Egypt. And um, rather stupidly, in one of his postcards to the University and Library, in which he was trying to get some money out of the library, because Schechter was very good at about taking the manuscripts that were sent to him and then forgetting to pay, um, uh, he, he, um, he says that um, if the library should be interested in an ancient Sefer Torah, so a Torah scroll, a scroll of the Pentateuch, um, found in one of the Geniza of Cairo, Egypt, written on leather of Roebuck. So he actually told Schechter where he was getting his manuscripts from. And Schechter put two and two together and decided this Ben Sira must have come from this Geniza, this storeroom where you store sacred manuscripts. So he, he knew what he had to do, which was to go to his friend Charles Taylor and borrow a lot of money. Because he didn't want to go to a university committee because he was afraid if he went to a university committee, that would go in the minutes, people would talk, and Oxford would find out, and Oxford would get there before him because they had more money. Um, and his great enemy, Margoliouf, and his great rival, Neubauer, um, would, would have all of the glory of finding the lost Ben Sira. Um, and he had already experienced this because um, in that letter that he sent to Mrs., uh, Mrs. Lewis, he said, do not speak yet about the matter. Don't tell anyone about it. And of course, the first thing he did was he sent a postcard to Neubauer in Oxford saying, you know what, I've just discovered the lost Hebrew of Ben Sira. Um, now, Neubauer, who... Um, it, was a difficult person, even his friends admit, and Schechter would count himself as one of his friends, actually didn't reply to that postcard, but sometime later published from a manuscript he had found in manuscripts bought by Oxford University, uh, an early Hebrew copy of um, the book of Ben Sira. And he wrote to Schechter saying, oh, I've discovered, you know, in the manuscripts we've been buying from Egypt a copy of the book of Ben Sira. Um, by the way, I got a postcard from you a while back, but it was so damaged I couldn't read it. Um, so, so Schechter learned the hard way that you mustn't tell anyone what your plans are. And so he decided that he would borrow money from his very rich friend, um, Charles Taylor. Charles Taylor arrived in Cambridge. He was a mathematician. Um, like most, math most mathematicians in Cambridge in that day, far more interested in the Bible than he was in maths. In fact, if you look at his sort of academic record, um, there is very few mathematical publications. But there is a commentary on the Hebrew book of Pirkei Avot, um, which is still regarded as one of the best commentaries ever written by a Christian mathematician um, <laughs> today. <laughs> Anyway, she um, Schechter knew Charles Taylor, because Charles Taylor had been taught Hebrew by Schechter's predecessor, and he had continued working with Taylor. Um, and Taylor was rich because you had to have an independent income if you want to be an academic, and also he had been a bachelor fellow, because he joined the university at a time when you couldn't be married. 
Um, he was elected to become Master of St. John's subsequently, at which point you urgently need a wife because you have to have someone to throw dinner parties and tea parties because, you know, the, the social side of it is all important. And he was a gruff old mountaineer. Um, he was incapable of that. So he married a woman 30 or 35 years younger than him and went off on honeymoon around Europe for six months where he died of apoplexy. Um, <laughs> So, fortunately, that was after he had lent Schechter lots of money. <laughs> so Schechter went off to Egypt, um, uh, schmoozed the chief rabbi of Egypt, and was told, yes, there's an old synagogue down in Fustat, the original Islamic capital, where there was an ancient Jewish community, and the synagogue is still in Jewish hands, and it has been for its entire history, which dates back to at least the early 11th century, but probably older. Um, and consequently, has never been pillaged. It's fallen down a few times, but the Jewish community has always put it back up. And yes, there are manuscripts stored in there. Um, and in fact, they're stored, um, they're dropped into this two-story storeroom through that hole in the wall that's in the women's gallery of the, of the synagogue. Because this is an oriental synagogue, so it follows the wider customs of the land in which it is, um, in which it's situated. And the women enter through that door at the top and the men from the door at the bottom so that the women sit in a sort of mezzanine around the top and don't disturb the men while they're praying down below. And perhaps one of the women's jobs was to take leftover sacred writings and drop them through that hole in the wall, uh, fulfilling a Jewish prohibition against allowing sacred books just to be left casually uh, dis uh, around once they're finished with or thrown away with the other rubbish. Now, Schechter was uh, shown the synagogue by the chief rabbi. The chief rabbi authorised him, authorised me to take from it what and as much as I liked. Now, as a matter of fact, I liked all. So he took 193,000 pieces back to Cambridge, and he had to take a lot because, as he says, it is his battlefield of books, a battle in which the literary productions of many centuries had their share. And they're all strewn around with some of the belligerents having perished. He, he gets quite purple prose in this, which, which some believe is written by his wife. Um, because he was his English. Which, you know, he'd only arrived in England a short period before. His English was surprisingly good. Um, so he carried, he spent some time sorting through this storeroom, trying, essentially he was looking for fragments of the book of Ecclesiasticus, for more fragments of the lost Hebrew of the book of Ben Sira. But he spent some time sorting through it and eventually just decided to carry it back to Cambridge, which he did with the blessing of the Jewish community and with everything signed, stamped and sealed because it was, at the, uh, sealed because it was this very fortunate period of time when we were looking after Egypt. Um, so we were able to, to help him with the acquisition. Uh, it looked like that in its original form, and these are all pieces of Bible, but you can see they're not uniform in any way. They're pieces there of Torah scroll, there's, people of biblical, uh, there's pieces of biblical codex from, from great um, model codices, along with more personal codices that would be used, uh, especially with the introduction of paper, that would be used for people to follow the prayers in the synagogue themselves. There are pieces there with Tiberian vocalization, the vowel points of the Tiberian, the common system of vocalizing Hebrew, and there's pieces there with Babylonian vocalization, the the now defunct system used by Iraqi Jews, and uh, buried in there also the Palestinian vocalization system. So there's Bible, but there's lots of different kinds there. And that's what you expect to find in the Geniza. We've been tidying it up for a few, uh, uh, well, for over 100 years. It now looks like this, which is a librarian's dream. And it looks like this, which is a researcher's dream. Anyone can come and look at it. And just recently, we've digitized it. So it's now all available online. And as a result, scholarship is really taking off. because. The natural audience for this, you know, the scholarly audience for this is mainly in the States and in Israel. And it used to be when I first started working in the Geniza that our manuscripts reading room would be full of Israelis during the summer. Um, now they can all sit at home and look at it, uh, you know, whenever. Now, Schechter, in his article in the Times, after returning from Egypt, explaining what he had done and what he had brought back, defines Geniza probably better than anyone else has, has subsequently defined it. The Geniza, to explore which was the object of my late travels in the East, is an old Jewish institution. The word is derived from the Hebrew verb ganaz, actually a yeah, Persian word originally, and signifies treasure house or hiding place. When applied to books, it means much the same thing as burial means in the case of men. When the spirit is gone, we put the corpse out of sight to protect it from abuse. In like manner, when the writing is worn out, we hide the book to preserve it from profanation. The contents of the book go up to heaven like the soul. And you can see that. So this is a manuscript recovered from the Geniza. It's a copy of the Mishnah, the Jewish law book. The Jewish law has several sources. The Bible is the fundamental um, uh, source of Jewish law. And in the Bible, the Ten Commandments are the, you know, the central uh, the code of Jewish law. But the Bible only covered certain particular circumstances, and that left a lot of gaps. So the rabbis began discussing it based on the oral Torah that had been given to Moses on Mount Sinai by God. Um, and they carried on discussing it until eventually they decided to write down those discussions in the 2nd century CE, because that was a time when there were 
there were lots of um, violence and danger of it being lost. Um, and that became the Mishnah. And then the Mishnah itself posed so many questions, they had to continue discussing it through the Amoraic period, and they didn't write those discussions down until several hundred years later. But the Mishnah is the main code of Jewish law of um, late antiquity. And the Mishnah actually says what, uh, what you should do with sacred writings. Kol kodesh matzilim All holy books you should, should be saved from fire. And this is what you do on a Sabbath. So on a Sabbath, you normally can't do very much. You mustn't work. It's the day that God rested. But there are some things you must do no matter what day it is. One is save life, and the other, one of the other things is save holy books, which is like saving life. Um, you must save them from fire, whether you read them or not, so whether they're holy to you or not, if they're still holy, and the definition of holy is unclear, but does it mean it has the name of God written in it? Um, you should save them. Um, and no matter what language they're written in, you should hide them away according to the law of Geniza. And Geniza is an um, obscure enough word that they've had to put vowel points on it um, so that people know what the word is. Because it's an unusual word. In origin, it means treasury or storehouse. It occurs in the Book of Esther, where it's borrowed from Persian. But it comes to mean a sacred storeroom in a synagogue where you deposit books that are too holy just to be discarded. If you discard them, people might cut them up and use them for amulets or they might be used for other purposes, or in any case, if you just discard something that has the name of God written countless times in it, you are showing disrespect. And in the earlier strata of the Geniza, this is what you find. You find Bibles, you find prayer books, you find Torah scrolls, you know, the, the main liturgical objects of the Jewish community of Fustat. Um, this is a great Bible, a, a, what we, you know, a kind of model codex uh, from the, the late 10th century, probably, uh, you know, a bifolium which is effectively half a sheep. So when you think that there are maybe 400 um, folios in these books, you know, that's an awful lot of sheep. This is, a, this is a, a, an economically strong community that can produce books like this. Um, and sure enough, it's got one, one, it's a Bible, so it's got the name of God countless times in it, but somebody has also written on it, Kodesh l'adnai l'hei Israel, lo yimacher lo yigael. Holy to the Lord God, uh, Lord um, God of Israel, um, it should not be sold, nor should it be pawned. So it's been dedicated to the synagogue. So somebody perhaps commissioned this to dedicate it to the synagogue. It's produced by the finest scribes. We know that a Bible like this would cost, cost about 25 dinars. And if a monthly wage of a skilled worker was about three dinars in those days, that's a considerable investment of money and time to produce it. Um, eventually, however, the book will fall apart and it is deposited into this storeroom. Whether it's dropped, from the second story women's gallery all the way down, um, it's it difficult to say. Perhaps there was a different entrance to that room. It's not clear. The synagogue fell down enough times over its history that we, we can no longer discover what it looked like at the time that it was first uh, instituted. But of course, the nature of sacred is changes over time. So the synagogue storeroom was attached to the synagogue where there was also a school. And it was the duty of every male Jew to be able to read the Torah. And the way they taught the reading of Torah was to copy out the Bible. And so they used leaves of the Bible from the synagogue to practice their Hebrew on. So here you have a child's alphabet written next to this sacred piece of Bible, which you know must not be sold or, or pawned, um, but can be, happily be used by a child in his Hebrew lesson. Now, in there, um, we have things that are clearly much older than the synagogue. The synagogue dates from 1040. We know because um, we have records within the Geniza of it being rebuilt. It was pulled down, knocked down by al hakim in 1025 when he was going through his persecution of the Christians and Jews. Um, so we don't know when it was built before then, but we know the current building um, effectively dates from 1040. And yet, this is the oldest dated medieval Hebrew manuscript. It's not the oldest medieval Hebrew manuscript. Um, however, it's the oldest one for colophon and a date. So older than all those beautiful codices such as the Leningrad Codex and the Aleppo Codex um, because it has a date on it, which is written by a man called Joseph ben Nimored, a form of Nimrod, in a town in, in Iran in the year 903, or 903 to 4, because the Jewish year doesn't match. Um, so it is, you know, 140 years, 130 years older than the synagogue in which it was found, and it came all the way from Iran to be deposited into the synagogue story in Fustat. So Fustat was the centre of the Jewish world in the 11th century. Previously, the Jews of Baghdad, and a lot of the Jewish traditions that carried on today, such as reading the Torah through in one year in the synagogue, the types of prayers like the Amidah, the form of the marriage deed, are all Iraqi Judaism. 
Because when the Abbasid Empire arose, the Jews of Baghdad um, found themselves at the centre of the most magnificent empire of its day. And consequently, their own star rose. And they became the dominant form of Judaism, sending their messages out across the whole civilised world. As the Abbasid power you know, collapsed, um, and the Fatimids rose up in, in North Africa, and they moved from Karawan to, to Fustat, and then built their new capital in Cairo, that became the centre of the Jewish world. And the Jews there their star rose, and they became important. So manuscripts came to Fustat. So we're very fortunate we got the Fustat Geniza at this time. If we got it in a later period, or in an earlier period, it might not be so magnificent. Some of the manuscripts have been sorely abused. Um, it's the nature of a Geniza that, that writings are never finished with. Paper, or in this case parchment, is expensive. You reuse it wherever possible. So in some cases, we have many, many layers of text. Uh, we, uh, it was clear that the Fatimid Chancery made money by selling off the old Chancery decrees because there was huge, great things written in ornate Arabic script. And if cut up, they could be used for loads of letters or copies of poetry on the back. And so we have lots of, it's an irony, great irony, that the Cairo Geniza, from a synagogue, contains one of the world's best collections of Fatimid Chancery documents. Also, Christian palimpsests. So Schechter discovered this very early on. Well, the story is he didn't discover it. He had some writings which he saw Greek on. Um, the professor of Greek called by his, the, you know, his room he had in the library of all the manuscripts in crates. And Schechter, without raising his head, said, oh, there's some Greek stuff over there. Take it away and see what you can make of it. And the professor of Greek put it in his bicycle basket, because it was Cambridge after all. And while cycling home, happened to notice he had found Aquila's lost version of the Bible and crashed his bike. Um, <laughs> It's a great story, like all, many of the stories in the, in the Geniza, and probably true. Um, this is not Aquila's version. What this is, um, if you look at it, you, can see, you should be able to see columns of Greek. So that, you, know, you have to look past the Hebrew. It's been used by a Jewish scribe in the 10th century to write Hebrew poetry. Um, but underneath is a very faded, perhaps it would have been completely invisible when he copied it, but the ink has returned with the, um, with the rusting, essentially, of the, of the iron in the ink. Um, and if you look and you turn it upside down, you can see clearly here three columns. So you've got the end of the left-hand column and then two other columns. And this is Oregon's hexapla, only the second manuscript that ever discovered. Um, third century CE, critical edition of the Greek Bible, produced for the early Christian church, so that they could all dispute from basically a common text. Uh, and uh, lo and behold, uh, it, it turns up in a Jewish collection, having been reused to write liturgical poetry. You can clearly see the columns, the left-hand column. We're, list we're missing the most left-hand column, which is the Hebrew Bible. That would have been written in Hebrew. And then you have the Hebrew transliterated into Greek script. So you have a, basically a pronunciation of how Hebrew was pronounced in the third century, the most important column. Unfortunately, we've only got the ends of a couple of words there. And then you've got the Setigit, the Jewish translation of the Greek Bible. Um, and then uh, the version of Symmachus, Theodosian, and uh, Quilla. So... The Geniza wasn't just for, Jew, uh, for Jewish scholars. There was uh, things of immense importance. And in fact, in the early days, because Schechter took off and went left to go to America, um, it was mostly those scholars who, uh, who did the early work on the Geniza. So it was no real surprise that things like this were published very early on, whereas many other things were published much later. However, what's most surprising is those were all holy works. So even the, 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 the Christian Bible would still be recognized by a Jew if he's following those laws set out in the Mishnah as a holy work, because it's still the same God, it's the Abrahamic God. But what surprised Schechter, perhaps didn't interest him so much, but has come to interest scholars now that fashions have changed in scholarship, is the amount of everyday detail that was in the collection. It wasn't just that they put in holy manuscripts, but they put in their everyday writings, their letters, their legal documents, their shopping lists, their economic texts, and it's not entirely clear why. One reason is perhaps because you can't write a letter in the Middle Ages without mentioning God. In this case, this is a poor woman, um, your poor maidservant, who's all alone. Um, she suffered a, a disease um, which has um, uh, affected her on her nose. Um, this was a letter written in Hebrew. Because it's written in Hebrew in the early 11th century, Jews spoke Arabic. She's probably from Egypt, although she might be Byzantine originally. Um, Hebrew would have been a common language if she were Byzantine. Um, however, if you wanted to make an announcement in a synagogue, or if you wanted to prove your worth, you would write in Hebrew. 
The only language suitable for use in the synagogue was Hebrew, so if you wanted to have your letter read out in front of the public, and if you're seeking charity, that was the purpose of the letter, then you should write in Hebrew. And she writes in rather good Hebrew, although there's a clue in it as to suggest that she didn't write it herself. Anyway, she received an injury upon her nose, and it separated, and has unfortunately eaten away the flesh of her face. And she now cannot go out, and she is ill, and she has no one to look after her, and no work. And she is seeking the charity of the community, and she is happy to stay in for start, or go to Cairo, or go anywhere the Jewish community wants to send her, so she can be on the poor list in that place. Because there was a tendency, for start, got overwhelmed by people seeking charity, so they tend to send them off to way, um, you know, far away to, to be a burden on other Jewish communities. Um, the scribe who wrote it accidentally wrote her face and then corrected it, which suggests it was written for her. Although it is known, and we certainly have letters written by women, so we know they could write Hebrew. They went to school just like boys. We have strong evidence of that. Evidence of schools as well. This is a very throwaway note. Um, I'm informing my lord the sheikh, written in Judeo-Arabic, so it's the spoken language of the Jews. It's not to be read out in the synagogue. It's a communication between a teacher and a father of a boy at school. So he writes it in Arabic. But because he went to school and learned Hebrew before he learned any other written language, and he learned Hebrew by copying out the Bible, he most naturally writes Hebrew characters. So when he writes Arabic, he writes Hebrew characters, Judeo-Arabic. Um, I'm informing my lord the sheikh, uh, God bless him, um, that Abul Hassan um, has been getting on very well uh, since he arrived in my school. Um, but I'm also informing him that another boy called Abul Hassan, now these are Jewish boys, but they have Arabic nicknames that they're used in school, and there are only a few of those, so there's a tendency for them all to have the same name, who's um, known as the son of Wu Haib, um, conspired with the other children in the class, um, and broke his writing board. Shalom. So it's a note sent home to say your son has been a victim of bullying, probably because he was too keen in class and drew attention to himself. Uh, he'll learn. Um, and uh, he's had his writing board broken because he, in, in, in you know, those schools at that time, they would have sat on the floor with a board on their knees, much as traditional Jewish tribes still do in some communities, um, and not sitting at tables with chairs. Uh, so this is, by anyone's standards, a piece of ephemera. You know, it, if you got this note, um, what would you do? You would screw it up, give your son a clip around the ear and buy him a new writing board, tell him to keep his head down. Um, but no, this piece of uh, parchment it is, I think, um, gets placed into the Geniza. Why? It is not clear. Uh, did, when people died, did they just clear out the contents of their desk drawers and put them into the Geniza? Because most of it would be holy. Or is this in itself holy? I mean, it could be on two reasons. One, it says, God bless you. Now, the word he uses in the second line in the middle there is Allah, which is, of course, you know, the Arabic word for God, but it's a Jew writing it to another Jew. So, you know, it is, it is the God of the Old Testament. Um, but it's the Abrahamic God in any case. Or is it because they're writing in Hebrew characters? Because although it's the Arabic language, he's writing in Lashon Kodesh, the language that God chose to transmit the Bible in, therefore the holy language. It's not clear, but we shouldn't really question it because we're fortunate to have it. What other collection, what other archive? Archives are planned, you know. Um, people choose what to put in them. In the Geniza, it appears to be entirely random, that they just sometimes were, you know, perhaps were overwhelmed with the amount of written material that might be in someone's house when they died, and they just deposited it. Or perhaps people came on holy days and deposited whatever they happened to have lying around, and people didn't sort it out. And so that's why we have some of the largest collections of children's material. So not only the exercise books that they copied from, and they would have had to share because these are expensive, illuminated productions, some of the only things to use red ink in whole Geniza, um, but the, what the children wrote when they copied them. And even what preschoolers produced when they had time on their hands, showing again the ubiquity of ink and paper. And you know, that, that, you know, a child at that stage of life would draw that no matter what century you lived in. Because that's the period of time when you, you've learnt that the head is separate from the body and you don't draw like a Mr. Men-like character. And you've drawn a belly button, but you still think hands look like brushes. <laughs> So I won't, I'm running out of time, so I won't talk too much, but essentially I was going to talk about the uh, centrality of Fustat, why we're fortunate we had Fustat. Um, this, is a, this is a divorce deed uh, found in the Geniza um, and written in, in Cairo. Um, it's written in the 11th century, and whenever you put a date, you have to indicate where you are, because the system of dating depends on what, what land you live in. And so in this case, they've said it's stated so-and-so uh, year um, in the city of Ba'ir al kahira in the city of Cairo. So that magnificent city of Cairo, built by the Fatimids, um, where they, they had their capital, um, you know, full of palaces, walls, and so on, and should have outclassed for start. But 
the traditional formula for saying where Cairo was, even long after Cairo being founded, the, uh, the, say, the third quarter, the fourth quarter of the uh, 10th century, um, it says, in the city of Cairo, Hasmucha Lifustat, Mitzrayim de Al Nilus, which is next door to Fustat, Egypt, which is on the Nile. And so that's the precedence of cities in Egypt. So everything is, is marked by where it is in relation to the Nile. And then it's for start, and then Cairo, which is next to for start. And even hundreds of years later, the Jewish community is still marking things like that because to them, for start is the main town. It's still the main administrative center. The caliph may live in Cairo, but most of the work happens in for start. So that's why we're fortunate we have the for start uh, Geniza. Had we the Cairo Geniza, as the title suggests, we would have far less material in there, and perhaps the material more from the assimilated Jewish community that were closer to the Fatimid court. A little selection of material, the historical, this is what the exhibition focuses on in Cambridge. The, these um, letters and documents that perhaps only survive because they're written in Hebrew characters, whether or not they're written in Arabic, or perhaps because they mention names of God, often Jewish uh, uh, letters will still start with the Hebrew equivalent, the basmala at the top, in imitation of Arabic literary style. Um, they have given us this detailed picture, particularly of the 11th and 12th centuries of the Jewish community, at a formative time, an important time, the end of a period of peace and prosperity, the arrival of the Crusaders in 1099. And you can already see the disintegration of rule. This is a letter sent from um, Damascus in 1050. Um, it's right at the edge of Fatimid rule, and periodically Fatimid rule breaks down, particularly when governors die or are moved to new jobs by the Fatimids, and there are often periods of anarchy, and this is one such period of anarchy, and the Jewish community have written a letter back to Egypt, because they need the support of the Jews who are close to the Fatimid court in Egypt to get things changed. And they said that the evil men took over the town, and they conspired under the name of so-and-so, um, and they came to an agreement, and they said, um, uh, they said, um, and they decided, sorry, that they would, um, they would cut off our access to the water supply. That is, the Jewish community's access to the water supply. Ki amru, because they said, Why should the Hebrews drink from our water? So it's an outbreak of anti-Semitism in uh, about 1050 in Damascus. And they did further things. They prohibited the Jews from uh, slaughtering, and they imposed harsh taxes on them. It was solved. The end of the letter says that they managed to get a new governor installed and they applied to the Fatimid Caliph through the Jews who were members of his court um, to have a manshur issued, a, a formal rescript, um, reinstituting the Jewish rights over the water supply. Now these sorts of events very, very rarely occur in Cairo or Fustat proper because that's, that's the centre of the Fatimid Empire, but we find it around the fringes. And this kind of blatant anti-Semitism is, is remarkable in that it is a whole letter is written about it because it's unusual. Now at the end, they have their old rights reinstated, but only after the new governor has demanded a huge bribe because he's far enough away from the Fatimid center that he can afford to abuse his authority. Most interestingly, one of the things that comes out very strongly in Agnesa is the centrality of Jerusalem in the Middle Ages, which is not, you might think, you know, it is the holy city. Um, that this would be a natural thing. But in actual fact, in medieval Judaism, the main centers of governance, of religious governance, where people wrote to for, for legal advice and religious advice, and where, and where the great works were written, were, was Iraq, was Baghdad, the, the, the old yeshivot, the academies of Surah and Pumbaditha. But in actual fact, what was being rediscovered in uh, the Cairo is that there was a yeshiva in Jerusalem too, and that there was a whole branch of Judaism, the Palestinian branch of Judaism, and the synagogue in which this Geniza was found, the Ben Ezra synagogue in, in Fustat, was one of two synagogues in the town. One was the Babylonian synagogue, and one was the synagogue of the Palestinian Jews. And the Ben Ezra synagogue was known in the Middle Ages as Kanisat Hashamin, the synagogue of the Syrians, of the Palestinian Jews. So what we've discovered from the Cairo Geniza is the lost world of Palestinian Judaism. Um, and this is a letter from the Palestinian Gaon, the head of the academy in Jerusalem, whose name is um, Josiah. And he writes his name at the top there, Josiah, head of the yeshiva of the pride of Jacob. That was the name of the yeshiva. Um, son of the scholar. And then he hasn't put his father's name because once you reach a certain position in Palestinian Jewish society, you no longer need to mention who your father is. Everyone should know this area. Um, and it's, got, it's, it's written to Egypt and it's got greetings. It's written, I think, to the community of Damietta in Egypt. It's got greetings. Um, and it says... Um, 
we would not trouble you. Know, our brothers, that we, it's only the nature of the time, the pressure of the time, of this moment, that causes us to trouble you. Um, essentially, he's asking for funds for his yeshiva. Most of the letters that come from the yeshivas in Iraq and Palestine are fundraising letters. Um, we never used to write to you for money because we used to be mit panasim mit zadam alchut. We used to be funded by the malchut, by the government. And when he says the government, he doesn't mean a spiritual government, he means the temporal government. We used to be funded by the Fatimid state. So actually, the religious center of religious government, governance of the Jews um, in Jerusalem actually received money from the Fatimid state. Now, what we know about the Fatimids, this makes perfect sense. They were very interested because they were you know, a Shiite um, uh, a thin layer of Shiite rulers over a large Sunni population in Egypt. They were very happy to, um, they got along very well with minorities. In some cases, they felt they had more in common with Jews and Christians than they did with the Sunnis. Um, and they employed them in their administration. And they also, to save time, trouble, and money, allowed the minorities to rule themselves. And one way they could help that, facilitate that, was to give money towards supporting some of these traditional institutions. So they supported the Gaoni in Jerusalem. So that's one of the great revelations that came out of it. Of course, this ended in the uh, early 11th century as the Fatimid state itself suffered from various financial crises. It had a huge standing army. It had a perpetual shortage of cash. Um, and increasingly, there were interruptions to their flow of trade in the, later in the Mediterranean, earlier on in the, the, the Banul Jarrah wars in, uh, in Palestine, and so on. So we're beginning, really, the Geniza opens at the pe period, the pinnacle of the Jewish community, and we now have the period of decline, down to the Seljuk invasions in the second half of the 11th century, the Crusader invasions, which follow as a natural result at the end of the 11th century, and then the long period of the Crusader kingdom in the following century. Um, things never go back to the way they were. The Jewish community of Jerusalem is never again funded by the Muslim government. Um, just to end, and one of the surprising things, uh, so this, we've, we've recovered in many cases the liturgical items as well as the documentary items, but even liturgical items give a picture of the world in which they come from. So this is a, we call it a Megillah, a scroll. It's not actually a scroll. You can clearly see it's a page from a codex. Um, but they're calling it a Megillah because it was read on Purim. Purim was traditionally when you read a Megillah. So it's the Jewish, it was one of the few very, very happy Jewish festivals where you celebrate the deliverance by reading, um, the deliverance of the Jews in the Persian Empire by reading the Book of Esther. But in local Jewish communities, you might celebrate a more um, local deliverance if you have one. And if for start, they read this scroll celebrating a local miracle. Um, they, we found at least three copies of this scroll showing that it was read in this synagogue um, over a long period of time. We think we know who wrote the scroll. He lived in the 11th century. And he was one of 23 prisoners who were condemned to death by the um, Akkadi in uh, Fustat. Because, um, to cut a long story short, there was a public funeral. For, uh, the Jews had a public funeral. Uh, public funerals, uh, it was a very popular man who died. And so there were enough people walking in the streets that this encouraged the locals who uh, would probably have been Christians as much as Muslims to throw stones at the public procession because public displays of... Um, of your religion were not were frowned upon. A riot ensued. The Qadi sent in his troops. He didn't have police, but he had some kind of sort of troops. He sent them in. Um, they arrested 23 Jews, because they obviously caused all the trouble, and condemned them to death on the strength of Muslim witnesses. Um, because the Jews are citizens of the Fatimid Empire, they have the right to apply to the highest authority, the Caliph. So they wrote a uh, official um, request to the Caliph to hear their case. The caliph would have heard it at his diwan. He deposed the Muslim witnesses. He decided they were clearly lying. He freed the Jews uh, who were under sentence of death, and he, he, um, he condemned the Muslim witnesses to death. And um, one of those that he happened to free was a man called Shmuel Hashlishi ben Hoshana, Samuel III. He was third in charge at the yeshiva in Jerusalem and a well-known poet. And he wrote this poetic scroll to celebrate his miraculous deliverance. How miraculous was it that they were freed by the caliph? The caliph who freed them, who they talk about in the most laudable terms. I mean, he is, he is the wisest man who needs no one to help him rule the four corners of the earth from east, west, south, and so on, um, was Al-Hakim who only a few years later would be pulling down the synagogue, um, destroying the church of the Holy Sepulchre, walling up people in churches and synagogues, and generally you know, becoming the arch enemy of the, of the minorities in the, in the Fatimid Empire. So this really opens our eye on a period of time before Al-Hakim went a bit mad, lost control, 
um, driven by the constant failure of the Nile to flood, perhaps. You know, he lost grip of reality, whatever. But this shows that, you know, it's not a straightforward al hakim bad, Jews good. It's not, you know, it's not always that. And that's really the beauty of the Karyanisa, because even in its essentially secondary sources like this, it throws light on a period of time which we knew very little about. And there is no archive like it in any of the Middle Ages. I mean, the fact, you know, a combination of climate and security and the fact that the synagogue remained in Jewish hands for all of its uh, life, even uh, till today, uh, means that these documents never were burned or had to be uh, uh, taken away and buried or whatever, they remained in that building. But, um, it, you know, despite searches in uh, other old ancient centers of Judaism, in Baghdad and in Damascus, they have never found anything like it. And so the serendipity that started with the two Scottish women showing Shecht or something, which just happened to be the one text that he knew all about and could recognize in an instant, um, down to uh, his friend Charles Taylor being one of the richest men in Cambridge, able to fund him to go there, to the fact that the Jews of start severely exceeded religious law by putting in everything they wrote, including things they shouldn't have put in, their magical texts, which they used for assassinating people, for instance, um, is just one of the great, many great miracles of the Kyrianesa. And despite it being in Cambridge now for 120 years, we still have at least another generation of scholarship to do before we've even finished cataloguing the collection. Such is the richness of it and also the smallness and difficult to readers of it. Um, okay, thank you very much. Thank you.